How does one possibly enter into the mind of God? For those of us who have studied some Hasidus, you know full well that whatever God is, is totally outside of the radar screen of the human being. Totally outside of the radar screen of angels. Even the most superior angels in the highest world. Even in the realms beyond that. So how can we even dare to think of entering into the mind of God? Well, it's no different than you entering into my mind. You have no idea what I'm thinking about this moment. Multiply that by infinity, and that's the attempt to enter into God's mind. But if I choose to reveal my thoughts to you, how would I do that? I'd speak to you. And by speaking to you, I begin to share something about myself. Even if I should lie, God forbid, that too tells you something about me. So the short answer is, we can only enter into the mind of God to the extent that God spoke to us. So, where and how did God speak? In the beginning, there was the Word. God did speak. We have all these statements, ten statements. Esa memory. Vayomer Elohim yehi or, vayomer Elohim yehi rakia, and onwards and onwards. Speech is revealing, God chose to reveal itself to us. And without such speech, we wouldn't know. But tell me, did you hear God speaking? Presumably not. So how does God's speech still allow us to know God? And why didn't God think the world into existence? Would they not have been more sophisticated? Very often the students approach me and say, you know, the Bible is such a simplistic work. God speaking, that's ridiculous. If it had said God meditated, that would have been a bit more relevant. So why speaking? Well, if I think and I meditate, I'm effectively invisible to you. That won't help you know anything about me. And therefore, if God thought of creation, there's nothing that we could know about God. So God deliberately spoke creation and brought creation into being. We'll explore that a little bit further. When we speak, what do we reveal? What do the tonal qualities of the voice reveal? What does the choice of the language reveal? The tenor. It tells us much more than the information. It tells you how I feel. It tells you something about my desires. It might even share with you something about my goals, my mission. That's all implicit only in speech, nothing else. The way that divine voice can be heard requires a filtering system. That filtering system we call Tzimtzum. Now you've come across the word Tzom, Yom Tzom, the day of fasting, which is a name given to Yom Kippur. Tzimtzum derives from 
Tsom. It means limitations, but more correctly, the word I used earlier, filtering. How did the invisible God reveal itself? Through words, as we said. Hasidus describes these as God's clothing. Clothing over the invisible man. God is unseen, but there is clothing. The world, the beautiful sunsets, the green pastures, the beauty of the Mona Lisa, the music of Mozart, the way that we love each other. These are expressions of clothing that Hashem puts on to allow us to see him. But also in a way which I'll describe to hear him. If I want to look at the sun during an eclipse, I can't simply look up there. I need to have a filter so that I won't be blinded. God also applies a filter so that we can see. Let's say that the inner God is Yud and a He and a Vav and a He. That's so bright, it's impossible for us to see. So God wants us to see, so God puts one filter around it. Let's call that filter the world of Atsilus. We try to open our eyes to blinding. Another filter, another layer, another lampshade. Bria, still too bright. Yitzira, no, doesn't work. My eyes still hurt. Asiya, ah, now I can open my eyes and see. Problem, but I can't any longer see God because the four veils, the four shades are just too thick. So we have the irony. We can open our eyes and see, call that consciousness, but we can't see God. So we only can see the clothing that God's, God wears, which is what I described to you earlier, the world in all its exigencies. This process is called tsimtsum, the filtering process that allows us to open our eyes and see. I said to you that there are four filters. We have atsilus, bria, yetsira, and asiya. They're interrelated. So imagine a light with four lampshades, beautiful lampshades. And only because of the fourth lampshade are we able to see. Each world is a spiritual redaction and spiritual compression of the world above it. You exist at this moment not just in your body. You exist in the higher realms contemporaneously at the same moment. You are a spiritual umbilical cord. One end is connected in the Ein Sof, Hashem. The other end is connected within you. Your soul isn't a pinpoint within. It's as I described to you, a spiritual umbilical cord. And it stretches through all the realms of existence. So if I might say, your subconscious, for want of a better term, is fully aware of phenomena that you aren't able to speak about and see in this realm, but you're there. So for example, as I said in a class this morning, when a person is asleep, that means there's a slight disconnection, dislocation, of the soul from the body, 
because the consciousness rises along that spiritual umbilical cord upwards, and you are more aware of the higher worlds. But since you are in your body, that image of yourself in the higher worlds is distorted. That's why dream work can be very difficult. And I don't necessarily advocate that you rule your life through dream work. But it is a little hint of who you are in the higher realms. And when a person, God forbid, is unconscious or has a near-death experience, it's their capacity of being able to view our souls from that higher place. But let's not go there because that's not the subject of this particular uh, session. But Tsimtsu means that as it comes down, as the spiritual umbil umbilical cords consciousness comes down, it becomes reduced to less spiritual apparition to the point that it becomes physical. Our world is physical. But what's physical mean? Take a spectrum. Here's a spectrum. On the right side, I have the heaviest material, let's say lead. I move across on the spectrum, a little bit further across, and I have less dense material. Let's call it wood. I move further across, and it's even less dense. It's water. And then I move further across, and it's air. I move further across, and it's molecular structure. I move further across, and it's atomic structure, subatomic, energy. And what comes before that? The spiritual energy that is able to manifest itself all along this particular axis. It's all spiritual. What physicality is is the densest spirituality. But everything is holy. Everything possesses value. There's no such thing as something without a soul. The chair that you're seated on possesses nefesh, a level of this five levels of the soul. There are five levels of the soul. Nefesh, ruach, neshama, chayin, yechida. The physical realm, the lowest aspect, the inanimate, also possesses soul. So here you have it. You have the four realms. And have a look how complicated it gets now. Inside each one of these four realms is a structure. That structure is the template of creation. It's the paradigm. Everything in existence possesses the ten elements that you see microscopically, microscopically inside that diagram. Let's have a look at it a little more closely. They're called the sephirot. You've seen diagrams of it. The sephirot are the energies, for want of a better term, that make up everything in existence. Everything. The human being is based on the template of God's creation, and that template operates in all the worlds and all the spiritual worlds. This is the architectural drawing that Hashem used to create the world. So the sephirot themselves are ten spiritual component parts, characteristics that make up the matrix of creation. If we can understand these, we can understand ourselves. If we can understand these, we can understand all of creation. We've been created in the image of God, so everything in creation is our image. That is an amazing statement. God makes itself known in all of the realms and even in us. So those of you who say a certain paragraph on Friday nights introducing Shabbos from the Zohar called Pasach Eliyahu, and you read it in English, 
It's the Zoharic text that tells us how each of those ten manifest in the human being, features of the human being. So now let's ask ourselves about this sifirot, so we can ask ourselves about the nature of the cosmos and ask ourselves about God's nature. We are asking these things only because God made it known through the Torah. So some of you will ask me, but where in the Torah is this written down? No, it's not written down expressly as a narrative. Because the Torah is not a narrative. It's not a history book. The Torah is a code. Every single letter of the Torah possesses shape and sound. The Aleph base consists of 22 code items. Each one points to a creative force. The shape that the force enters into our reality is the shape of the letter. It traces a certain pathway, hence the shape of the letter. In other words, the shape of the letter tells us about that particular energy. But not just the shape of the letter, but the sound that it makes. And we simulate that energy sound through breath, rising within, impinging on the voice box, and then being shaped by the five parts of the mouth that provide sound from that shape. And what are the five parts of the mouth that shape that sound? The teeth, the tongue, the palate, the lips, and the throat. So what we're doing is taking the physiological form of the human being, using breath as a mechanism to mimic something about the energy of that letter, likewise the shape of the letter. So these 22 letters are code for creative energies. They make up words because when we put forces together, they create entities. Vayomer Elohim Yehi Or, God said, let there be light, Aleph Vav Resh, Or. That means that the spiritual composition of light is made up of the forces of Aleph Vav and Resh. And now you start reading the Torah in a very different frame of mind. At the same time, it is descriptive. At the same time, it is instructional. But that description and instruction relates to the truth of creation. And that's what we call mitzvah. Mitzvah from the Aramaic term tzavta, which means connection. A mitzvah is the way that we utilize the light of each letter to connect to Hashem. At the moment of mitzvah, we connect. And the primary motivational force of all of our lives is to connect. That's the most powerful motivation all of us have. And what's the most powerful way that it expresses? Love. And when we love, we connect. When we hate, we disconnect. And then the range in between. The purpose of life is to connect to each other and through each other to Hashem. So, these ten sefirots operate in two dimensions of the human being. The first three, Chochma, Bina, and Da'at, as I explored with some people this morning, present as your mind. Now, be careful. Mind is not brain. Brain is technology. Brain is physiology. Brain is machinery. When energy flows through the brain, 
when the neshama animates the moach, the result is the experience of mind. Mind is a consciousness experience. They're the first three. I'm not going to, at this moment, describe how each of them operate. It's not the function now. Then we have a second consciousness flow, and we call that emotion. And there are seven component parts of emotion, seven emotions, and each one is made up of each other. So you either have seven squared emotions, 49, which is, incidentally, why between Pesach and Shavuot we count 49 days, because each day is a way of being able to refine through introspection and practice one of the shades of emotion. So a Hasidic psychologist would have at his or her fingertips a template of no less than 49 shades of emotion for analysis purposes. That's much more sophisticated than anything we can find in the Western world. So these two flows of mind and emotion, Seichel and Midas, three and seven, make up the ten sefirot. And as you saw earlier, those ten sefirot operate in each of the realms, as I showed you in a previous slide. In each of the realms, those ten operate. In fact, the bottom sefira of each realm becomes automatically the top sphera of the realm above it. So they are interlinked. Interlinking is called hishtalshulus, from the Hebrew shalsheles, which means a chain. And the way that a chain operates is that the links connect so that the head of the link is above the bottom of the link above it. And that's exactly the interrelationship that we see here of the Sefirot throughout the world. Okay, so let's have a look at the Sefirot now in terms of you and me. Because what's the purpose of knowing this information? It's so esoteric. It's so otherworldly. Why study it? Why study Hasidus? Why not just follow Shulchan Aruch? Laws, instructions. Tell me what to do and I'll do it. Why do I have to have all these aspects of spiritual teaching surrounding it? Well, let me ask you. If you take a road journey... Most people take a road journey by looking up the map. Well, these days we don't look up the map, do we? We, can't, can't, we look at Waze, and Waze gives us the most direct way of getting there in the shortest time, because that's the kind of world we live in. Once upon a time, I remember as a young child when we used to take road trips, we used to look at alternative ways, that not ways as ways, ways of being able to get to our destination, if we had time, we would take the scenic route rather than the most direct route. It's more beautiful, possibly runs along the sea. If you ever come to Melbourne, Australia, where I live, I'll take you along the most beautiful Great Ocean Road, which is considered one of the most beautiful in the world. And you take the scenic route. Therefore, taking that allows you to enjoy the journey. So when you look at the Shulchan Aruch and it tells you do A and do B, well, you're obedient. You're a servant of Hashem. You're humble enough to practice ego abnegation and do what the Shulchan Aruch says. But wouldn't it be wonderful if you could take the scenic journey through the Shulchan Aruch? where it's not just an instruction, but some of the beautiful underlying truths of which the law in the Shulchan Aruch is a mere conclusion, would animate you. When you put on tefillin in the morning, not just out of duty, but you recognize and experience how the one Shel Rosh 
relates to your headspace and to your mind and refines you for the day. And the shell yad on the muscle opposite the heart connects mind and emotion so that the physicality of your activities become guided in the day. And I've just said the words. There's a whole learning there behind it. The tefillin then lasts the whole day. Or when lighting Shabbos candles, you look at the blue heart of the flame and the yellow exterior of the flame. And you know the blue is chesed and yellow is gevura, two of the sfirot. And that only the feminine quality of the Godhead, the Shekhinah, and therefore the woman, is able to balance chesed and gevura in the home environment for the week. And therefore, and I've just said the headlines, it becomes the scenic journey. It's not just do it, but enjoy doing it. Be happy doing it. Become enlightened doing it. So that's what understanding the ten sfirot is all about. Understanding ourselves. Chochma, bina, and da'at. The way I give birth to a thought. Chochma. Birthing. Where did the thought come from? I went fishing in the pond of my subconsciousness and I caught that fish, that thought. How did that pop into my head? Therein lies already a most wondrous capacity, how you give birth to thoughts individually, differently, separately, because of your individual neshama. And then how do you provide body to that thought? We call that analysis, breadth, depth, length. And then how do you focus on it? so that it becomes a reality, not a set of abstracts. And by focusing deeply, meditatively, how that gives rise to feelings, and you suddenly embellish the coldness of mind with the warmth of heart, and therefore it gives a sense of satisfaction, and there's a rise of simcha. And then, Finally, you can open your mouth and say something or do something. That's all implicit in these 10 steps. And to understand that gives you a very powerful mechanism of self-understanding. It gives you a way of being able to introspect and provides tons of scope for meditative activity. I'm just holding out the promise in terms of this. So I kept speaking about the soul, the neshama, the spiritual umbilical cord which flows. That is God within you. That is your Beit HaMikdash. It's true that the Beit HaMikdash was destroyed, but we also know that when it was destroyed, it dispersed into each one of us. And somewhere deep within lies your truth. And that truth is connected intimately with your soul line. No one in this room has the same soul as the person seated next to them. Or in the room. Or in the world. Or in the past. Or in the future. You are individual. You are gifted in a way that no one else ever was, is, or will be. From there flows, as I spoke in my anger lecture, your self-esteem. To know that you are unique. Now, that can go to your head. It can become egocentric. So realize you didn't make it. It came from elsewhere. You're entrusted with your uniqueness, but you have to be assertive with your uniqueness. What does that mean? You have to contribute it. You've been brought in the world for a purpose, every one of us. And unless you assert your purpose in life, we're missing out. 
God is waiting for each one of us to assert our giftedness. As long as we know it's a gift, then you can be strong about it. So creation is a two-way street. Shahashem spoke the world into existence, but also thought certain parts into existence. God's thinking created the higher realms, the angelic realms, Atzilus, Bria, and uh, Yetzira. But the tangibility of the world that you and I live in is in Asiya. So which of the worlds is most important? So you would think the most important are the higher realms. Wrong. The most important realm is this mundane, ordinary, physical world where we all make mistakes and where we do silly things and the world plays silly games. How do I know that this is the most important world? The Sefer Hayetzirah, which is probably the oldest extant work of Kabbalah attributed to Abraham, has a very interesting teaching. It says, the stone at the top of the wall falls furthest from the wall. What does that mean? It's a cryptic statement. It means that when the stone at the top of the wall is there, its potential energy is higher than all the other stones. And when the wall crumbles and the stones fall, the top stone has the greatest kinetic energy and therefore it's able to roll away furthest from the wall. That which is highest falls lowest. Therefore, we know that there are high worlds and there are low worlds. This is the lowest world. It means spiritually, its source is the highest world. Therefore, we know this is the most important one. And there's something further in there. This world is also made up of four levels. Human, animal, vegetational, and inanimate which is spiritually the most powerful, the inanimate, not us. For example, you just had lunch not long ago, you ate animal, vegetational. That's what gave you strength. You didn't give it strength, the food gives you strength, why? because they possess spiritual capacities and prowess higher than us. So it feeds us, which is, by the way, why we need to honor food. And you're not allowed to sit at a table without such honor, making a bracha, which means making yourself conscious of what's happening. You're borrowing the soul spark within the food, borrowing, and then it becomes part of your own energy system. And then when you go out into the world, and here's the punchline, and you use that energy well and wisely, you elevate the food, the spiritual source of the food. If God forbid you go into the world and do the wrong thing, then you have stolen the soul spark of the food. So there is a whole aspect there. And then there's one other thing which I'll share, say about the subject. As we say in Friday night in the Lecha Doidi, what was uppermost in the mind is last done. God wakes up one night with an inspiration. Let's create a world. Well, of course, even God has to consult his angelic town planning committee. And we're told in the Midrash that he does so. And guess what? They don't like the idea. What do you mean? You've got to create a world, and then you're going to have human beings, fallible human beings, who are going to mess up 
Stick with us, say the angels. We're a much better bet. But you know how stubborn God is, and God pushes his plans through the uh, town planning permit stage and building stage and creates a world. Step by step, what's the last thing created? Physicality. But we know that the last thing created is what the original intention is. If you build a house, you first begin with a concept, inspirationally. But what's the last thing that happens? Interior design, flooring, etc. The most mundane aspects. But that's the purpose. You step into the house and want to enjoy it because of its last steps. Our life here is the purpose of creation. What the human being is, we're the wild card of creation because we have bechirichavshis, free choice. That is the purpose. Hashem wants us to choose wisely. Therefore, da ma'lamayla mimcha. That sentence could be translated, it's a very famous sentence, know what's above you. Okay, that's great. However, the way that the Baal Shem Tov interpreted is, you want to know what's above you? Mimcha. It all comes from you. We are the final purpose of creation. What we do affects the highest world. It affects the purpose of creation. Hashem acted humbly, tzimtzum, lowered itself down to this level so that you and I can be co-creators of the unfinished symphony. Gave us 50% partnership. It's our choice whether we mess up or not. So, what is indeed in the mind of God? The answer is, we are in the mind of God constantly. As I quoted to you earlier, but here's the quote, the end is wedged in the beginning, and the beginning is wedged in the end. I use different words. End and beginning. In the beginning, inspiration. Architectural drawings. Site improvement, builders, bricklayers, finishing trades, end of project. That was what was originally in your mind, and that's the end. God intended, wanted this world. And this end is wedged in the beginning. That's what this cryptic statement from Sefer Hayetzira is all about. And what do we have to do to make it work? What is our role in this co-creator partnership? Our role in that partnership is that we actually master ourselves. Remember the well-known teaching, you control nothing in life except ourselves. Well, what does that mean? So it's a very beautiful statement, but what does it actually mean? to master ourselves. Well, let me ask you, has anyone in this group spent time mastering their thought patterns? Being able to ensure that negative thoughts get kicked out? Do you have a technique? Do you use a methodology? Very often people consult with me because they can't fall asleep because they have these uh, nasty thoughts circulating in their mind. So I teach them a displacement method. It's very, very simple. I ask them to choose three most beautiful memories, whether they be in childhood or adulthood, and we go through each one meditatively, exploring each one, in the, with all the senses operating, color, sound, every aspect, fragrance, until that memory is so poignant and is so rich that when you pull it into your mind, when you slip that slide into the projector of the mind, it takes over the mind. Now, God created us in such a way 
that we can't think of two things at the same time. Have you noticed? You can oscillate quickly between two thoughts, but you can't think two thoughts at the same time. Therefore, if the negative thought enters, simple, put a new slide in, the one that you practiced. So I tell people to practice that meditation three times a day for 60 seconds for one week, and it becomes an effective displacement mechanism. So you'll say, uh-oh, but, you know, as soon as I stop that, it'll, the other one will come back. Not if you're consistent, because if you're consistent, I don't know if you picked it up in Dr. Newberg's class this morning, but the idea being that as you repeat a thought pattern over and over again, it can become the new habitual or default pattern. So by repeating it over and over again, it becomes the more dominant and displaces eventually permanently the negative one. An example, that's just an example in terms of thought. What about words? Do you practice verbalization? What words to choose? What tone of voice to use? And our behaviors, are you able to observe your nonverbal behaviors and what are they actually portraying? Are you being empathic and compassionate with your whole body or just with your words and onwards and onwards? So that's what I mean by mastering the way that the soul expresses through the body. So in order to enter into the mind of God means to be able to carry out Hashem's choice of creation and we are its purpose and to do it in a masterful manner through self-understanding and understanding the cosmos and interfacing in the most ideal way which is called through mitzvot. So I want to wish you a lot of Hatzlocha. Life is a beautiful journey but you have to look at it positively. You have to put on the glasses that are able to perceive the same picture, but have it positive. As the Rebbeim always said, beginning with the Tzemach Tzedek, Tracht gut und werd sein gut. Think positive and the outcomes will be positive. That's not just the same as the uh, um, Book of Trust, which has recently been published, which is a section of Ibn Pakuda's work. Oh, it says there very clearly that the positivity of thinking creates the pathway for success. Listen, the positive thinking builds the pathway for success. It's not just be positive, but be positive because that positivity determines the outcome. That's a very powerful thing. And the Rebbe spoke extensively about this, especially in the area of health and well-being. The Rebbe was adamant that well-being and health has more to do with your mindset than even with the medication. You need the medication as well because the doctors were given the permission from above to heal. If you like that video, hit the subscribe button and notification bell below for hours of the best Jewish content online.